Turk. Um, so there is lucky for me, there's a lifeguard boat there. So I, I treaded water, called for help, waved my arms in the air. And um, they picked me up out of the water within a minute. And um, they got me in the boat. They took me around the, the um, jetty to Balboa Coast Guard and um, called EMS. And that's where they loaded me into the ambulance. So I got to Orange County Global Medical. And after four hours of surgery, two blood transfusions, um, it was three broken ribs, fractured pelvis, detached tricep down to the bone. Um, and I was bit front and back. So uh, 161 staples and seven stitches later, um, I recovered and, and moved on to do triathlons again. And, and now I have full use of my arm. I, I don't, the only issues I really have left is I have a few rib issues left. But uh, Chris Lowe did come out with uh, Ralph Collier to the hospital. My husband had the wetsuit. So they DNA'd the wetsuit. They determined it was a great white juvenile about uh, 10 feet long. So that's about, Chris was saying about eight years old. So I was pretty lucky it wasn't um, a large female uh, because my arm was in front and it missed my heart by centimeters just because my arm was in front. So I'm pretty happy to be here. Yeah, I love you here. Happy you're here. Yeah, yeah, thank you. When was that? So that was May 29, 2016. So I'm almost five years out in May. Yeah. And since then, I've met uh, David McGuire from Shark Stewards. He's a, a nonprofit in San Francisco. So he knows Chris Lowe quite well. And they've, they've done a few um, like tag, tagging sharks and stuff. And they've collaborated on a few things. So um, I'm advocating now with, with Shark Stewards. And we're, doing, we're starting to do more beach cleanups here and partnering with um, Surf Rider as well and doing some beach cleanups. And we do an annual run for sharks and ocean health. Um, at Newport Dunes to raise funds for uh, David's programs that he does. Wow, that's amazing, Maria. That, that uh, you were you were actually, I think, training when that happened, right? Were yeah, you yeah. Schedule. Yeah, I was training for a half Ironman, so I was swimming. I was, my plan was to swim for a mile, but I only got ten minutes in <laughs> wow. before it happened. So. So that's, that's pretty cool that I can say that I'm here and I got bit by a shark and, and now I'm listening all about sharks and learning more about sharks every day. That's amazing. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so amazing. Oh my yeah. God. I cannot imagine how uh, like that experience. Yeah, it was pretty intense. I was so lucky I didn't see it coming or going because I think I would have had more trauma associated with the whole thing. Um, I was able to get back in the water Two, two, um, two and a half years later at the same spot um, with a bunch of uh, shark survivors. And, oh, wow. um, and we were able to swim the buoy line and, and Leyland Connolly does, had a few articles out in the Orange County Register. So wow. it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a life event that kind of changed my course of direction. And, and now I'm advocating for sharks and and just because they are essential to the ocean ecosystem, right? Yeah. yeah so. Well, I mean, I don't know what to say. You are amazingly brave, Maria. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, David was gonna try and get on the call today, but he had a board meeting. So um, I'll make sure that he sees it on YouTube. And if you could just give me the YouTube channel when we're done, uh, Bill, okay. and I can, I can send him to the YouTube channel so you can, hear what you guys have said. <laughs> well, Maria, glad you're with us. That's an amazing story. I uh, well, thank you. grew up on that beach and was a lifeguard in Newport for 10 years. Big Crono is the first beach I lifeguarded at. And my friend, Mike Ewer was in that boat that grabbed you. Oh yeah, he's the guy who picked me up. Yeah. With Andy, Andy, Andy Matsuma. Matsuma. Yeah. yeah. And but, I saw Andy recently, last year. Yeah. We were swimming and I saw Andy and we got to say hi. Yeah, I'd love um, to connect with you on the shark uh, awareness and the thing at the dunes afterwards. Yeah, oh great. Because yeah, Mike was telling me he, he's heading that up. 
Perfect. Yeah. I'm a part of the South Orange County chapter of Surfrider down here in San Clemente. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. So I'm interested to see how close the sharks swim to my house every day. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's almost 6.30, but we'll just wait a few minutes for more people to arrive. Sounds great. Hey, Michelle. Hi. Hey, John. Thanks for sharing the good news today. I guess you'll update everyone in a few minutes, but uh, I'm excited to hear more details. Sure. That no, was a good day. How's the uh, sewage spill situation in Newport? Uh, well, if there was one, I was in the water surfing today, so uh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> I saw the headline. I didn't see exactly where it was. Was that Richard? Yeah. Where did you hear about it? I saw the headline at OC uh, Register. So if you're on your computer, you can probably uh, search for it. I will check it out. But I have to imagine, you know, when they say Newport, I'm imagining it's not near Balboa, so. Huh. Could it's be, in uh, the bay somewhere. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. It looks like it's in the picture behind your head. No, this is uh, Seal Beach. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably Back Bay because when, when the rains oh. come, that Back Bay gets really bad. Yeah, that's probably where it's at. <sighs> oh, it's between Bayside Drive and China Cove, so it's in my neighborhood. Ooh. Oh, there you go. Actually, so China Cove, there's um, an old lab there that Caltech has. There's only one man that works in there, and he um, grows sea urchins for research. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's like the best office you could ever have. <laughs> it's right on the water. Right. That's the one where those apartments are, right? down at the bottom where those big mansions are? Uh, yeah, yeah. And the lab actually has some apartments for um, visiting researchers, but it's mainly the biology grad students use them sometimes. I didn't even know about it when I went to school there. So um, UCI was talking about moving into the space and doing some work, but I don't know what the status is right now. Yeah, I have a friend who lives right across from there, or right next door. That's where I actually started swimming when I first got back in the ocean, five months later. Nice. Yeah. Does, does the researcher release the sea urchins when he's done with them, or what's he doing with them? <laughs> I think they get used for genetic research. Oh, okay. Interesting. Maybe. And then I think he does something with um, starfish. Because so, he's talked about moving them around the world for to give them to other researchers. You know, go back in time and talk to my high school counselor about jobs. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, tonight, Lorena can tell us about how she got into this. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, well, um, should we get started now? Yeah, I think we're a critical mass and people would still hop in, so go for it. 
Okay. Um, hi, my name is Michelle Jerome, and I'm the chair of the Newport Beach chapter of Surfrider Foundation. And today we're excited to have Lorena Silva from Cal State Long Beach's Shark Lab. Um, before we get to the talk, we're going to go through some updates from local chapters. So that's South RC, Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, Seal Beach, and Long Beach. So first, um, let's go from south to north and Henry, Henry Chow can start with updates about South OC. Hopefully, so um, hopefully the connection's decent because everyone is freezing every now and then. But uh, just a couple quick updates. We um, filed an amicus curiae brief earlier this week to uh, object and overdevelopment of homeowners. Um, that are right on the beach down in San Juan Capistrano. Um, we're addressing some egregious coastal development, including armory, armoring and beach loss due to sea level rise. Um, that was done, I think, the 15th. So that's like fresh off the press. Um, and then also just wanted to just um, recognize, our, recognize our robust OFR um, program down here at South OC. You know, during COVID, it's been really tough for these restaurants. Uh, unfortunately, we only lost to two um, restaurants during COVID times, and so we're pretty excited about that. But then we're also planning to work on a like a joint chapter meeting um, that will hopefully coincide with Ocean Friendly Restaurants 2.0 launch. So more to be uh, more to develop on that one. Um, and then finally, Laguna Beach um, early early in the process of some additional um, single plastic reduction use. So we're we're monitoring that pretty closely and um, we'll keep you guys updated. So that's what's going on down here in South OC. Great, thank you. And next we have our vice chair from Newport Beach chapter and that is John Wadsworth. Thanks, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> good to see everybody, kind of. Um, looking forward to the day when we can actually do these in person. Um, but I just uh, wanted to provide two updates. Um, one is, and I think a lot of you on the on the Zoom here have probably heard about it, but uh, last week was Surfriders um, uh, Hill Day, um, Coastal Recreation Hill Day, where in, in for those of, the, those of you that don't know what Hill Day is all about, uh, Surfrider descends on Washington, D.C. to lobby to our representatives about um, the priorities for Surfrider. Um, around ocean and beach preservation. And this year, what, it was my first time doing it. It was obviously virtual this year, um, but this was the, a record year for the number of delegates that uh, made, you know, made the commitment to talk to the representatives. So just some, some numbers. There was over 160 individuals from 78 Surfrider chapters and student clubs. Uh, we met with 163 congressional offices from 25 states and territories in just in two days. So it was a, a huge task um, organizationally to get all those meetings set up, but um, there was a, a, the delegate from Orange County included myself, um, Richard um, Bush from uh, Huntington Beach and Aaron Rowland from Long Beach. And we met with four of our representatives, uh, Representative Michelle Steele, uh, Berrigan from the 44th district, Alan Lowenthal from the 47th district and then Representative Correa from the 46th district. And I can, I can tell you it was, it was really, um, my takeaway was, was really refreshing to hear, you know, whether you were on the right side or the left side, the common theme in these meetings is everybody really cares. And I think, um, you know, my first time doing this, it was great to see partisanship being tossed out the window for, you know, the issues that are really important to all of us and, and, and certainly surf riders. So I thought it was an amazing couple of days. And, you know, for those of you on the call from surf rider, if you have a chance to do this in the coming years, do it. It's amazing. Um, so that's one update. The second update is more local here um, for, for Newport Beach. Um, in fact, today uh, it's official and surf rider Newport chapters um, excited to announced that we've adopted a portion 
of the Santa Ana River Channel. So you guys all, I think, all see when you drive the freeways, um, the adopt a freeway um, program, you see the signs up and down the freeway. Well, the County of Orange has the same thing for all the, for the watershed, for the channels um, that eventually drain to the ocean. And Surfrider Newport, um, after about a year and a half of, you know, permitting, insurance, we threw a pandemic in the middle of that, it was finally signed up today. Um, we've adopted the last mile stretch from at, you know, right around Adams Avenue towards the beach. So it's kind of the last line of defense, if you will. And um, there's more, more announcements to come in terms of the um, events that we're gonna run around cleaning this thing. I was in it today surveying it. And if I told you it was a disaster, that would be an understatement. The amount of debris and trash that is, that is built up in you know, just this mile stretch is really shocking. I mean, I knew there was going to be a lot, but what I saw today was just, we had a lot of work to do. So um, certainly want to partner with Huntington Beach, South Orange County, um, we'll collaborate on this to, you know, cause it's a Herculean task to get you know, the trash out of this portion of the river before it reaches the ocean. So just got that wrapped up today. We're super excited about it. And like I said, we'll look forward to, um, or look for future announcements about events around cleaning up the river. And sorry for the long update, but I will pass it back to Michelle. Thank you. And next up, Roberta Wynash, the chair of the Huntington Seal Beach chapter. Hi, I'm co-chair with Casey. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so we're, we're getting excited about starting up live events again, hopefully soon. But in the meantime, we've had a couple corporate cleanups with 30 people or less. Then we've also had Congresswoman um, Michelle Steele and Richard Steele at cleanup. And um, we've been promoting our solo beat cleanup, and we've had a great response with that, and we've been posting about that on our website. The harbor cleanups are starting up again, so we're excited to have that happening again. We have, right now, we have three high schools that are having a competition, and that's going to go through spring break. And then they're gonna document and all the trash they collect, and then we'll um, declare a winner. And Ocean Friendly Gardens, we have a high school that is um, doing a garden at their school. And then Tony has been helping them and guiding them. So we're excited to see that as it finalizes. And Casey's gonna talk next. You're muted. Yeah, just uh, thanks, Roberta. Yeah, I want to piggyback on what John said. I mean, that's awesome, John, about the Santa Ana River and and getting that. You know, that's uh, that's great. We'll cer certainly help you out. And in the chat box, I was talking about Goat Hill and all over there. I mean, over on that side, I mean, it gets it gets crazy over there with a lot of the trash and all that. So, whatever we can do to help and all that, you know, we'll certainly help you out. Um, you know, I know Richard, uh, along with you, when you talked to Michelle Steele, Michelle agreed to be doing a beach cleanup uh, here in Huntington Beach because she lives over here in this area. Uh, so that's good to see. And Richard proposed her and some of the other uh, assembly people from the, the, our California State Assembly who are Democrats work. So we got, again, cross aisles and cross pollinating. And again, you know, pollution, it's not a left or right issue, it affects everybody. Um, but I do want to just say something neat. And uh, if you take a look at the screen, and I don't know where you are, but if you see a young man out there with blue shirt on, blonde hair, Daniel Hughes. Daniel Hughes is our new Huntington Beach uh, Surf Ambassador. Daniel Hughes is a member of the United States Olympic team. Um, he is, uh, represents uh, the uh, SUP group. Uh, he just won bronze medal in the Pan Am Games for his extraordinary airs he gets in SUP uh, surfing. And he is now joining us and he's going to be our local surf ambassador. And we're hoping that this kind of goes up even a step to where it might be more like a global type of thing. But he's going to be helping us out at events, uh, helping promote the sport. We're going to help him as well. And he actually, you might recognize him. 
because if you watch Fox Sports West on their uh, TV show, they have World of Waves. And it's all about Daniel going around. So he is a big international TV star now because this is spread around the world. And I'm just going to put that in the chat box in case you guys want to, um, um, you know, check it out. You can go there. Um, and really, that's it. That's all I have to say. But welcome, Daniel, to the Surfrider family. Thanks, Casey. Uh, appreciate it, you guys. I'm stoked to be here. Uh, I love surfing. I spend most of my life in the water. So I'm stoked to give back and make sure we keep the oceans clean uh, for, you know, generations to come. Phew, right on. Thanks. Okay, and last but not least, Long Beach chapter, we have Chair Nina Whitsett. Yay, hi guys. Um, so, we kind of, I feel like, took an unintentional hiatus for 2020 with all the crazy things. Um, but this year at the end and the <clears throat> start of this year, we really uh, refocused um, and are really putting in a lot of effort to uh, get back and going. And I think we're off to a really good start with that. Um, we have our goals that we're focusing on and chipping away at and we are looking to get more uh, volunteers this year back um, and have people in general just get back into it after last year. Um, any updates? We did have um, Aaron, as was mentioned, go to Hill Day as well. So I'm excited to hear about her uh, report back. We had, I guess, one of our things this year was our Belmont pool um, situation. <laughs> and we did end up uh, losing that one, but you, you can't win them all, I guess. And um, we also are still just trying to promote the beach cleanup with uh, COVID still present. Um, we have a competition going um, for March and we are also looking to collaborate more um, in these types of things with other chapters. So we're looking forward to that um, this year as well and to keep connecting and supporting each other. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, now we're going to get started with the talk. So before I introduce our speaker, I just want to say that we'll have time for questions at the end of her talk. And you can write your question in the chat box, or we can also, um, or you can also ask in person. So um, let me introduce Lorena Silva. Lorena Silva earned her master's degree in marine biology at Cal State Long Beach's Shark Lab, where she is now a science educator. Her thesis research focused on the round stingrays metabolism and how climate change will impact this stingray population. She's also taken part in research on juvenile white sharks, and she has collaborated with U.S. and Mexican research institutions. She's a Fulbright Fellow from Lima, Peru, and her research work prior to her master's work has taken her around the world at the Smithsonian Institution, the Charles Darwin Foundation for the Galapagos Islands and other environmental NGOs in Peru. She has studied stingray and shark diet in Peru, mobula ray fisheries in Peru, green sea turtle nesting and recruitment in the Galapagos Islands and humpback whale census in Peru. Her research interests lie in understanding how the environment affects the physiology and behavior of sharks and rays, particularly under the effect of human activities. Please give a warm welcome to Lorena Silva. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for your wonderful introduction. And thank you so much everyone for hosting me and for having me here. Uh, I am very excited to talk about uh, our research in the shark lab. And give me one second for some reason I cannot uh, change my slides. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so I'm going to skip this slide. I was about to introduce myself, but I'm going to start talking a little bit about the California Long Beach Shark Lab here in Southern California. And um, sorry, something weird is happening with these slides. So uh, the California Long Beach Shark Lab is one of the oldest shark labs in Southern California. Actually, it, it was funded about 60 years ago and the founder was Dr. Nelson, which was one of the pioneers shark research studying uh, sharks behavior underwater. And Dr. Nelson one of, was one of the first uh, researchers in the world um, doing this kind of research from the shark lab. And he was one of the first ones uh, helping the Navy developing the sonar technology that was developed for the Second World War in order to detect submarines. So he was the one helping the Navy developing this kind of technology uh, into uh, telemetry technology, acoustic telemetry technology that can be used in order to study marine life or marine megafauna and in order to study tracking their movement in their movement behavior. So uh, afterwards, uh, Dr. Christopher Lowe, which is, which is the, our, uh, the one that is uh, the professor running the lab right now, um, he took the leadership of the laboratory in, the 19, in 1995. And interestingly enough, he was um, the uh, master's student of Dr. Nelson. He was studying uh, torpedo rays and electric discharge in torpedo rays when he did his master's um, study here in Cali Long Beach. And then after finishing his PhD in the University of Hawaii, he returned back to Long Beach and took the leadership of the Cali Long Beach Shark Lab. So in our laboratory, our goal overall is to study uh, aspects of physiology and behavior and ecology of marine animals. And I wanna highlight that uh, we do study sharks, but we also study other marine animals of commercial importance, such as bonefish or sea turtles. We also had students studying sea rays, et cetera. So our main goal is always to uh, cover or study aspects of uh, human activity, and how human activity can affect the behavior and ecology of marine animals. And in overall answering questions that are important in terms of conservation and management. However, in order for us to be able to answer those questions, we rely heavily on uh, cutting edge technology and also engineering and mathematics. But today I'm going to talk uh, about juvenile white sharks and our study of about 10 years uh, on movement tracking research so what we know about white shark is that yes, we can find them in California waters and uh, over the past, um, in the past the populations were almost overfished by gillnet fisheries. And it seems like over the past 20 years, the populations have been increasing. And it seems like a fact, the fact that there were a number of norms and laws uh, that might have allowed these populations to grow over the past 20 years. For example, in 1972, about this time, um, there was the Marine Protection, the Marine Mammal Protection Act that allowed the marine mammal populations to grow after they were almost pushed to the, ver the verge of extinction. Also in 1994, uh, California state started the protection of white sharks and also started the, pro uh, the prohibition of gillnet fisheries which one, was one of the main fisheries uh, activities that was killing most white sharks in shallow waters here in California. Uh, in 1996, for example, also there was a Sustainable Fishery Act that, uh, that started reducing bycatch activities or bycatch, um, uh, starting to uh, develop strategies to reduce bycatch. So all those laws might have allowed the population of white sharks to grow over the past 20 years. So now we are seeing more white, sh uh, white sharks in California waters. But before jumping into our research, I want to talk a little bit about white sharks and what do we know about these species. So we know that white sharks are known by uh, for being top predatory fish in the ocean. Um, they have been estimated to live up to 70 years old. Also, uh, they can they are born having four feet of length and they can reach up to 20 feet of length. Interestingly, in sharks and rays species, females are always larger or grow lar much larger than males. So the largest female shark that has been uh, recorded in the whole world has been a female of 20 feet. However, the largest male shark that has been recorded has been a male of 16 feet of length. 
um, they are able to reproduce when they reach about 11 feet of length, which is more or less the size of a paddleboard. And, and they can have um, about two to 10 offsprings every time after the gestation period. So um, interestingly, uh, sharks have this sixth sense that we human beings wish we, we would have, uh, which is the ability to detect magnetic fields which is a sense that they use a lot in order to uh, undertake long migrations from different remote places. Um, also, white sharks are very well known for, have, for having a great sense of smell. So they are known for being able to smell a colony of seal, seals um, or sea lions uh, a thousand miles away. So, Another interesting thing about white sharks is that they can change their diet as they, as they grow. So typically juvenile white sharks, they are of course much smaller, but they also feed on um, small fish and stingrays. And the reason why they feed uh, on stingrays and small fish is because, not only because they have a small mouth, but also because they have a much narrower and pointer, pointed teeth that allows them to have a good grab of a, of a slippery prey. So we know that juvenile white sharks, they typically eat, feed on small fish and stingrays in, in shallow waters, while larger sharks or adult sharks, they develop a narrow, a wider and much noticeable um, serrated feed that allows them to um, effectively cut through the flesh of, cut through the thick skin of sea lions and, and other marine mammals. So another interesting thing about sharks overall is that they can grow feet during their whole lives. So they can constantly replace their feet. So white sharks particularly can have up to 300 feet in their mouth. They, those 300 feet are disposed in seven rows in the upper and lower jaw, and they can constantly replace their feet as they, as they lose feet with every meal. So what we know about white sharks in California is that their um, population is distributed, uh, is, is separated geographically. We typically find um, adult sharks in Central California and Northern California. And we know that these, uh, the reason why we might find adult sharks in these areas might be because of the greater population of uh, elephant, uh, elephant seals, California seal lions and, and other seals. Uh, we tend to find younger juveniles and newborn white sharks in Southern California because the waters tend to be much more productive and we find uh, a, a greater population of smaller fish and stingrays. However, we, with the growth of this population, we wanna, wanted to understand how this species is using their habitats, when they come to California, when they are using this, how they are using these habitats, how they are move, moving, et cetera. So the type of technology that we use in order to study um, how sharks move in our laboratory is acoustic telemetry. So this type of technology is based on, um, as, as the name implies, is based on sound waves that uh, are emitted by transmitters that you can see right here in this, on this hand. Uh, these transmitters emit sound waves that are able to travel through water. And these uh, sound waves are picked up by an hydrophone, which is, the, this kind of bottle that you see over here. So this is called a receiver or hydrophone. And this is the device that is able to pick up those sound, wave, sound waves. So um, we have transmitters of different sizes and the size is based on the battery storage of the, of the transmitter. So for example, the smallest transmitter you can see right here, it can last from two to three months while the largest one, which is the B16 can last up to 10 years. So all these transmitters have a unique um, sound wave, a unique sound frequency that can be detected by the receiver. So every time that a tag chart pass uh, within a distance of 300, feet, 300 yards or 500 yards um, in proximity to a receiver, the receiver will be able to pick up the unique sound signal of that tag and we will be able also to collect information about the date the time when the shark passed next to the receiver. And many, many cases, we also associate a hobo, which is a temperature sensor 
to our receiver. So that way we can also collect information of the temperature of the water when the shark was passing by the receiver. So this type of technology is wonderful because it allows us to have a fine scale movement of movement information of the shark every time that the shark is swimming nearby a receiver or an array of receiver. So however, the drawback of this technology is that it is limited to the extension of our array of our receiver. Of course, when the shark gets out of our array of receivers, we won't be able to detect their movements. However, when the shark is within the array of receivers, we can collect a fine scale information of all the movement behavior and even the feeding activity in, in, of the shark. So for us, in order to recover the information, we always need a scuba divers. So the scuba diver will need to go to the water, jump into the water, uh, pick up the receiver, bring it to the boat, download the information and reset the battery so we can continue to record information. So we do this, um, we download it of information every, every month or every two months, and we do it in our whole array of receivers that we have in Southern California. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next uh, slides. So as recently, we have been able to help develop a new um, real-time live buoy, which is able to send text messages to our lifeguards and also to our laboratory every time that it the, the live boy receives an information or pick up uh, uh, the information of a tag chart passing next to the live boy. So this, this device is based on um, a receiver. The receiver is placed underwater and this receiver is collecting um, the sound wave information of the tag sharks that pass nearby within 300 yards of distance of this receiver. And this is able to translate this information into radio waves and send it to us uh, as a text message. So this is a wonderful new technology that we have been trying to develop. So in this, with this type of technology, we will be able to have uh, real-time information of the sharks that are passing nearby a receiver. Of course, this can only collect information of the tagged sharks. We have also to assume that there are other sharks that haven't been tagged and can also pass by the receiver and the receiver won't be able to collect them. Um, another interesting thing about this new technology is that it, is, it has solar panels, so it has constant power uh, given by the sun. And, and that way we don't need to, we don't have the problem of the battery battery problems with the receiver. So it, it's always charged by the solar panels. So with this type of technology, we hopefully in the future, if we get to uh, purchase more of these live voice and, and, and incorporate them in the in different beach areas um, that can be used as an early, um, uh, that can be used as, a, as an strategy to know uh, when sharks are passing by um, to a beach area. So the way that we use um, that we do that we uh, tag a shark is by doing either a surgically or surgically implanting the shark in the dorsal muscle of the shark, or by darting uh, a tag in the dorsal fin of the shark. So, for instance, here in this big picture, what we do is uh, when we get to encounter a juvenile white shark, typically when it is entangled in the fisher net, um, we help the fisherman to release the shark. But right before releasing the shark, we undertake this uh, surgery that can take from 10 to 15 minutes. And it's typically, do typically done by an experienced biologist that uh, inserts the tag in the dorsal fin, and then we release the shark. So um, the another way and the most common way that we do in order to tag a shark is by darting also a tag in the dorsal muscle of the shark. So in this case, we, uh, so some of the, uh, shark lab students use a jet ski or sometimes a boat, and we uh, chase a shark and we dart a tag in the dorsal muscle. So this is something that, um, it, the, so the shark goes pretty much hanging in the dorsal muscle, uh, like an earring, and it doesn't cause, uh, the, the pain that this activity can cause is pretty much like uh, the pain that we feel when we get a piercing in our ears. So another type of technology that we typically use in order to study sharks movement is the satellite telemetry technology. And as the name implies, this technology is based on uh, satellites 
that can pick up the radio waves that are emitted by transmitters. In this case, we have a different type of transmitters. As you can see here, all these two different type of transmitters have an antenna. So these transmitters emit radio waves, radio waves that can only travel through air and can be picked up by satellites and the satellites can send the information right away to our phones or to our computers. So however, the drawback of this technology is that the shark will necessarily need to come up to the surface in order for the signal to be, to be picked up by the satellites. satellites. Um, so as you all know, sharks, they don't need to come up to the surface in order to breathe. So, to breathe. so there are uh, low chances that a shark will come to the surface. However, most sharks come to the surface in order to thermoregulate and warm up. So in those times is, is when we are able to collect the information. So this type of technology help us to have a better, have a better understanding of uh, species that have uh, long migratory movements, such as white sharks. So with this type of technology, we will have uh, probably scattered points of positions in which the satellites were able to pick up the information of the tagged shark. So um, our shark detection array or our receiver array is uh, based on 62 acoustic receivers that have been located across Southern California and that we maintain in partnership with other research institutions such as the Channel Island National Marine Sanctuary and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. So this is our whole array that goes from Solana Beach in uh, San Diego County to Santa Barbara and then to Central California in Morro Bay. So over the past 10 years, since we started this project, we have been able to tag uh, about 134 sharks. And over the past year, in 2020, we have been able, our receivers have been able to detect 47 sharks, juvenile sharks, um, passing or, or, or using Southern California waters. So we can expect that the rest of the sharks, probably they have been out of the range of the receivers or probably the battery storage is already over. So our results um, indicate that most of the sharks that we find in Southern California are either newborns or juveniles, because, because every time that we go to the field, we have been only able to find uh, either newborns and juveniles of, uh, from four feet of length to nine feet of length. So interestingly, these juvenile sharks are using Southern California water during the summer and early fall when waters are warmer. However, when waters start cooling down, they start swimming south to Bahia Vizcaino, which is a very important um, nursery habitat in, in the Northeast Pacific. So we know that these uh, juvenile white sharks, they are very mobile and they can swim uh, up and down about a, a couple of, thousands of miles every summer. And every time that the waters war uh, cool down, they go to Bahia Vizcaino where waters typically may maintain warmer during the, during the winter. However, the largest sharks, typically the sharks that are around nine feet of length or 10 feet of length, they start swimming um, right uh, to Guadalupe Island, which is a very well-known island for their larger populations of marine mammals, such as uh, um, elephant seals, sea lions. So these juvenile sharks or larger juvenile sharks start migrating to Guadalupe Island, which is an important feeding area for juvenile white sharks when they start switching their diet from fish to marine mammals. Another interesting result that we have had from our uh, array of receivers is that it seems that uh, the, the shark aggregation hotspots change year by year in Southern California. So for example, in 2015 and 2000, from 2015 to 2017, we have seen that aggregation hotspots have been distributed, uh, for example, in beaches such as Santa Monica, Huntington Beach, uh, Belmont Shore, uh, and other beach areas. However, for example, in 2019, the most important aggregation hotspots have been Morro Bay, Santa Barbara County, and Solana in San Diego County. However, during 2020, the most important aggregation hotspots have been pretty much in Santa Barbara County and Solana and Coronado in San Diego County. 
So these aggregation hotspots is change year by year. And we have seen charts uh, moving and so pretty much uh, using these aggregation hotspots during the whole summer and using other areas uh, or the rest of the sites uh, as pass by areas. Also, most of the sharks that we have been able to detect have been um, sharks of newborn sharks, uh, smaller than five feet, and, and large juveniles that go to nine to 10 feet. Uh, during 2020, which is, has been very interesting, is that we have been found more sharks of, of uh, above eight feet, eight feet, nine feet, and 10 feet. So we have been able to find more large juveniles using Southern California waters. However, these, the fact that the aggregation hotspots change year by year makes us question what are the environmental parameters or what are the, what are the conditions that determine those, the, the change in those aggregation hotspots. So in order to answer those questions, um, we have been uh, using an autonomous underwater robot uh, who, which can do the tracking for us. So this is a project that is being run by a graduate student. Um, her, her name is Emily Spurgeon. And she's using this underwater, uh, autonomous underwater robot in order to um, recreate the three-dimensional environment around a shark. So this robot has a, a receiver that is able to detect the shark that is passing uh, in a proximity of 300 to 500 yards close to the robot. And it also has a bunch of sensors such as temperature sensors, depth, uh, depth sensors, light, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and chlorophyll. So it can, so th that way we can interpolate the, those environmental parameters with the presence of abs or absence of uh, juvenile white sharks in different beach areas. So she has been able to run this research uh, during 2019 and 2020 in four different beach areas, um, which includes Surfside, Belmont, Huntington Beach, and Padaro, covering about 150 kilometers of coastline. So right now, this is an ongoing project, and I won't be able to give uh, much information about the results because she's still working on this, but hopefully by the end of the year, we will have a, a better information about what are the environmental conditions that determine those hotspots, the change of aggregation hotspots for juvenile white sharks. So overall now, uh, the fact that we find um, pretty much newborns and juvenile white sharks in shallow waters in Southern California make us as hypothesize that these, they, these sharks might be using Southern California waters as, an, as, nursery, as nursery habitats. So typically Southern California waters tend to be uh, much warmer than other waters in the northern part of California. So we know that um, nursery habitats are well known for being much warmer. There is also plenty of food availability in shallow waters of Southern California. There is a high productivity and we find the small fish and also a large population of stingrays, particularly brown stingrays are very well known for uh, having a large population in different beach areas here in Southern California. And we have seen uh, several videos uh, of uh, baby white sharks trying to chase uh, round stingrays and, and eating them. So also shallow waters are, uh, provide safety from predators. So we like to know that uh, baby white sharks, they pretty much behave as any other fish. They don't know that they are white sharks yet and they are looking for areas in which they can stay safe from, from other predators and where they can also find plenty of food so they can grow um, quick enough. So however, the fact that we find these uh, baby white sharks using more and more uh, shallow waters in Southern California makes us question of how much these baby white sharks might be interacting with beach birds. Because also Southern California are, are, is a very well-known area for um, their, or, or a very popular area for their recreational activities. And we, year by year, we find uh, surfers, paddle boarders, sand paddlers, and uh, uh, different uh, groups of people doing wading, uh, fisher, fishers, etc., using uh, Southern California waters year round. So, in order to answer these questions, um, Patrick Rex, our uh, current graduate, graduate student, he is um, studying. He's using aerial surveillance, aerial drones, studying uh, drones in different beach areas in Southern California, 
in order to quantify water user activity, which is something that has never been uh, quantified in, in beach areas of the United States. So he's flying, uh, he's flying drones in different beach areas that I'm going to mention in the next slide uh, in order to quantify water user activity here in Southern California. Uh, in other words, he's trying to assess how much people um, overlap with juvenile white sharks. And also he's trying to quantify the behavior of sharks every time that there is an encounter of sharks with, with humans or beach users. So in order to do this survey, um, what, is, what Patrick is doing is to, he's running transects of about uh, one kilometer, one kilometer square. And he is trying to assess, um, he's counting the number of, of different groups of water users. And also uh, he's trying to uh, count the number of sharks present in that area and, 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 and see what is the behavior of the water users and the sharks. So over the past two years, since he started this project in 2019, he has been able to um, do 100, 450 surveys and cover 30 uh, beaches in Southern California. So over the past two years, interestingly, uh, he has been able to uh, find consistently sharks in Santa Barbara County and also in San Diego County, which is something results that coincide with our receiver uh, array uh, detections. So from, from the 450 surveys that he has been able to run, he has found uh, over 150 interactions between the past two years, 2019 and 2020. What he uh, describes as interactions is when a shark uh, is swimming at a distance of 60 yards from a person. So interestingly, uh, he, he encounters sharks always uh, outside the wave break. So why sharks typically move outside of wave break. And these sharks interact with beach users or, or water users that are also doing uh, recreational activities outside the wave break, such as stand-up paddlers, surfers, and sometimes swimmers. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, uh, so um, most of the from most of the 150, actually the 150 interactions that he has been able to spot over the past two years have shown indifferent behavior from the shark. So what he defines as indifferent behavior is pretty much when the shark is, is following its normal swimming trajectory and it doesn't change their swimming direction and speed regarding to the person. So interestingly, uh, he hasn't been able to find no aggressive behavior in all the 150 interaction over his study in the last two years. So the fact that we see more sharks in Southern California is wonderful because that means that the populations are recovering after having been almost pushed to the verge of extinction with uh, gillnet fisheries. Um, and that's wonderful for the balance uh, of the ecosystem. However, that also brings concerns about beach safety. So we know that the fact that there is no aggressive behavior being recorded over the past few years, that is not evidence of uh, safety under a growing population of white sharks. And we still have about uh, a rate of about two to three bites uh, that happen in, in California every year. So that means that we need urgently to be able to study these species and have a better understanding of their ecology and their movement patterns in order to uh, have um, beach safety, a, beach, a, a sound beach safety planning. So also there is a need for better laws in order to protect the sharks. And we know that unfortunately, there is a, a increasing illegal targeting of juvenile white sharks um, being done by recreational fishers in Southern California. There is also a, an increase of charming activity along public beaches here in Santa California um, that is not regulated. Um, and also there is an unregulated shark tourism in our, in our beach areas. So, um, so our project of shark beach safety is an ongoing project. We are still collecting data and we have been working together with, the, with California State um, 
trying to always proportionate data and information about uh, sharks activity. And also we have been uh, developing over the past few years uh, training workshops for lifeguards and fishers here in Southern California that we run annually in order to better inform them about all the information that we have been able to collect and all the studies and, and strategies to, to um, strategy for particularly for life, lifeguards so they can inform um, the, the people that use the beach areas in the way that can, they can stay safe. So the, the fact that we have been able to increase our research of, uh, in our array of receivers have allows us to have also an increase of uh, collaborations with other um, research institutions here in California and with in US public agencies, as well with, uh, as, well with, uh, uh, as, well as, as collaborations with Mexican institutions um, where we know that sharks also use uh, the habitat. So, we are trying to increase our collaborations with different institutions here in, um, in California and also with Mexico so we can set uh, a greater uh, research and much better uh, strategies for management and conservation. Also, our laboratories are hugely committed with outreach and educational programs. And over the past two years, we have been doing um, a number of outreach uh, programs such as the shark shacks that you can see right here, a few photos. So with the shark shacks, we have been able to visit during 2019, for example, 40 different beaches in which we have been able to engage with the public, uh, people from different ages and talk about uh, wildlife, uh, marine, marine wildlife here in California and also white sharks in order to inform, the, inform them about, about uh, beach safety strategies to stay safe under the presence of white sharks or sea rays as well. Also, we annually run the Shark at the Beach event in our laboratory in which we open our doors to different uh, people who want to visit our lab and we share information about our research and also we uh, uh, share our, our uh, we open the doors of our lab so they can see the, uh, the collection of fish and, and, and different species that we have in our laboratory and in the Moritz lab. We also are very proud that uh, to have developed comic books um, that talk about all this information about beach safety and and and, um, and marine pollution. That is, uh, is they are comic books that are uh, aimed for children. But we have been able to translate these comic books from English to Spanish, and now we have uh, these uh, comic books that are open access, and you can find them in the in our website. So hopefully we will be able to uh, share this information not only with here in the United States with uh, public institutions and the public, um, but also with other collaborators in Mexico, Central America and South America. So that's all that I have for you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions. And first one, I'd like to ask Casey to ask them. So Casey had some questions. Oh, great. Well, thanks, Michelle. Uh, that, first of all, that was a great presentation. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions real quick. Is there a link that you can provide to us that shows where some of the great whites might be at any point in time during the day, like click this link and you can see that they passed by this buoy at two o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday or something like that. So that's my first question. My second question is, I know researchers have been working with non-magnetic rare earth elements like sumerium and others as a shark repellent because they cause like a non-lethal type of electric shark uh, shock to sharks when they kind of get close. Is there anything that you've seen or worked with with some of the larger sharks? It seems to that these rare earth metals work with smaller species, smaller species, say that five times fast, but what about large species? Does it work with that? Have you seen anything along those lines? Thanks. Okay, thank you for your question, Casey. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a, it's a great question. So first of all, the first question uh, about um, the fact if we can, if we have a, any link or website where we can track 
the sharks that we have been able to tag. Um, well, we have been re recently incorporating this live voice that will be able to send uh, real-time alerts to lifeguards. And we have been able uh, to recently incorporate a new website system in which lifeguards can uh, help us download the receiver information and we can share information of the tagged charts uh, with, with different lifeguard agencies. So as it is right now, there is not a link uh, for the public so they can see the charts that we have been able to track tag over the past 10 years, but uh, we have been, a, we are trying to incorporate that um, <laughs> type of uh, information for library agencies and also um, uh, overall public, agency here, public agencies here in, in Southern California. Um, so answer your second question, uh, which is about uh, shark repellents. Yes, there is a number of grants about uh, of chemical and electric repellents for sharks. However, um, yes, we know that sharks don't like those repellents, but the fact that they don't like those repellents, that doesn't mean that they are effective, um, you know, controlling the sharks or, 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 or pushing the sharks away. Because uh, we have to take into account that these animals, if they are really trying to, if they are really hungry, <laughs> or if they are really trying to, to chase you, person they are going to do it with the repellent or not so as it is right now there is not really a good repellent that can uh, act effectively a hundred percent effectively uh, people can still use re repellents but uh, we have to take into account that under an animal which is very interested in in pursuing a prey or attacking there is actually no repellent that is going to stop that behavior so we, what we actually try to recommend is to have um, some clues or understanding about the environment and to prevent any shark attack. Like for example, trying to read the clues in the environment. So uh, just to give an example, uh, if we see uh, sea lions activity, or if we see, if we see a fish group swimming in the water, we, uh, we should try to get away from that from that school of fish, or we, we should try to get away from sea lions because we know that they are going to be the target of white sharks, and we don't want to, and we we don't want to get confused by by a group of fish or by a, a sea lion. So every time that we see those clues, we 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 try to recommend people, especially surfers or stand up paddlers, to get away from those areas. Also, another important clue that we can see in the environment is that typically when we see seagulls swimming around is when we find a big school of fish that are using the, the, the water, the, that beach area. So when we see seagulls activity, we also should try to avoid that area and move to a different beach area. So we are not confused by other predators because predators are following those clues and they are also trying to catch prey. Um, so yeah, that's what pretty much we <laughs> recommend, trying to read the clues in the environment and also trying to stay calm if they get to encounter a white shark. Uh, we, for example, we recommend people when they get to encounter a, a white shark and they, they are in the, in the paddleboard of, or if they are surfing, they should try to move the surfboard in the direction to the shark and stay calm and focus on the shark. And don't lose <laughs> track of the shark until they see the shark swimming away. The shark won't try to chase them. Uh, that would be a very rare behavior considering that we are not a prey for, for sharks. Um, we would expect the shark can be actually motivated to chase a person if there is any, if, the, if if we are fishing <laughs> and we have some blood or something that may uh, attract the interest of the shark. But if we are not having, we are doing those things and we are just uh, like standing in our paddles, we can just move our boards in direction to the shark and stay calm and don't keep, it, uh, don't, uh, keep an eye on the shark until we see the shark swimming away. Then try to go slowly to the shore. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks. Great advice. Um, so we have a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, 
but we'll go to the people who raised their hands. Um, Beth, do you want to go now? Hey, yeah, Luca had a question. Do you want to ask it? Well, he was wondering, um, what? Um, if you had a uh, two surfboards with a bucket of um a bucket that would fill a gallon of fish blood and then a gallon of um human blood, would the sharks go for both or just the fish blood? Uh, if we sh if we have, sorry, can you <laughs> can you repeat the question? So I think what he's really getting after is like, can a shark tell the difference between human blood or fish blood? Are they more attracted to one than the other? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, there has been research uh, on uh, sharks. Yes, there has been some, re some research done in the north part of California where we can find adult sharks in which these uh, researchers have been trying to see if sharks are more attracted to a um, certain type of bait compared to human to human bait. <laughs> so what they have they have used is for example a, a piece of uh, I think it was a pig or goat uh, flesh. And also they have used fish flesh. And sharks were more attracted to the fatty uh, flesh. <laughs> so yeah, sharks might be able to detect uh, among different type of blood or prey. And that might be based on the fat on, on fat <laughs> on the amount of fat present on that flesh so typically adult white sharks they would like to eat something that is has a greater content of, of fat so they would prefer to chase something that smells like fat <laughs> like pretty much like a piece of sea lion <laughs> or a goat or a pig <laughs> in this case like this this uh, ex experiment Thank you. And um, let's go with Matt Dolan now. I live in Solana Beach. Am I good to surf this weekend? Hi, is he living in Solana Beach? Yes, you might be able to. Yes, you can go and surf this weekend. So what we have found for during the this year, or well, um, 2019, 2020, is that the most important areas for aggregation of white sharks have been Santa Barbara County and San Diego County. And it seems like Solana Beach is being only a pass by area. So yeah, there might be some sharks passing by that area, but uh, you might be safe, <laughs> yes. Um, if you uh, try to read the clues in the environment, if you get to see, uh, big school of fish swimming close to you, you, sh you should try to avoid that area and move to a different area. Uh, also, you need to talk with the lifeguard in order to see if, if they know about white shark activity over the past week. Because sometimes when sharks use a uh, beach area, they stay for a couple of days. So it's very important to get in touch always with the lifeguard if you're going to surf in that area and ask them if they have seen a shark if there's shark activity, if they recommend to go to the water, and, and then you can you can feel safe to go to the water. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Brad? Hi. Um, yeah, this is Brad with the South Orange County chapter. Uh, sir, for a question about tracking. Um, how many active sharks are you tracking now? And are there other agencies or, or uh, projects tracking additional sharks in Southern California? Yes. Um, great questions, Brad. Thank you. So active tracking, we uh, haven't been doing active tracking per se. Uh, what we call as active tracking is when we uh, go on a boat and we try to chase a specific shark that has been tagged and we chase the shark with a boat. Um, oh, that's not yeah. So yeah. So that's what we, trackers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's what we call active tracking. So what we have been doing more mostly is passive tracking, which is uh, pretty much the use of receivers that can collect the information for for us 
and we go and download, download that information every month or every couple of months. Um, so how much we have been doing? A lot. So during this past COVID uh, 2020, uh, since COVID started, we uh, thought that we won't be able to go to the field and collect data, but luckily we have been able to go to the field and collect, still collect data and download receivers. And we have found uh, a lot of uh, shark activity. So uh, one of the, the slides that I show, um, show that actually we have been able to find a, a greater number of tagged sharks using Southern California waters during 2020. Which is also interesting because we have been also able to uh, find more water user activity in Southern California waters during the COVID during 2020, which has been a COVID year. So there are a great, an increase, there has been an increase of uh, water users in Southern California waters and also an increase of uh, sharks. Um, yeah. Thanks. You're very welcome. Thanks, and I'm gonna to go to the chat now because there's two questions that um, deal with where the sharks are. So the first one is, do you ever pick up readings of adult sharks crossing the ocean from here toward Hawaii or Australia? And the other one that's related is, can you comment on the diminishing great white population in South Africa related? Are you aware of orcas taking great whites off our California coast? Okay, so uh, the first question is about uh, if we have been able to detect adult white sharks uh, passing by Southern California waters and then crossing to Hawaii. Um, so no, <laughs> we haven't been able to detect uh, adult sharks passing by Southern California waters, but we do have been able to detect large juveniles crossing Southern California waters and going straight to Guadalupe Island. So Guadalupe Island is a very important feeding area for juvenile white sharks that are starting to switch their diet from fish to marine mammals, because we can find a huge population of uh, California sea lions and fur seals and, and etc. in uh, Guadalupe Island. Um, so no, our, our Receivers haven't been able to find any adult white sharks using shallow waters. Something that we have, I have to point out, is that our receivers are located in shallow waters of, across Southern California, California, and the sharks that pass out of the array, out, out of the array, outside the area of the receivers, they won't be able to be collected. So it's very likely that yes adult white sharks might be passing by Southern California in their migration to Hawaii. But see, if they are out, far out of our receiver array, we won't be able to detect those, those tags. Yeah, so that's about the adult white sharks. Um, about the population of sharks in Africa. So, so that's a wonderful question because that brings the fact that yes, there is a, a growing population, or there was a growing population of white sharks, adult white sharks in South Africa. And unfortunately, that uh, the fact that that can uh, bring a risk of shark bites uh, uh, have made that uh, in South Africa, for example, um, sharks uh, have been killed uh, in order to, to protect beach goers or, or, water, or water users. So, um, so we, we are, what we want to do here in Southern California, and the reason why our laboratory and our uh, leader and director, Dr. Christopher Lowe, is trying to push uh, more research into these species, is to be able to develop a good research that can be the foundation for a beach safety planning, so, so that we can allow to have a, a better strategies to counteract or mitigate uh, any human risk of shark bite um, in South California waters, because we know that this population is increasing, but that also brings a huge concern with beach goers that can get by, uh, and, and we don't want that to happen. So, um, so yeah, uh, so the fact that, um, for example, South Africa is like a good example for us to try to um, 
go in a different direction and try to develop more research and work in collaboration with the state of California and the public agencies so we can have a sound uh, science-based strategies to prevent uh, shark bites. Thanks. Thank you. I think I answered the, your all your questions. So I'm missing one. <laughs> oh well, there it's it's in the chat if you want to see it. Um, there's another question about orcas um, related orcas. to great white. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty. <laughs> so the uh, yeah, orcas are pretty cool. Uh, so sh sh white sharks are the top predatory fish in the ocean. However, the top is predatory. Uh, animal in the ocean are in fact the orcas and there are many videos that probably you all can find online in which you can see orcas chasing adult white sharks <laughs> and harassing white sharks and the reason for that is that orcas well we know that they attack in group we know that they have a social structure that can pass through generations and they uh, are they are pretty smart and they can attack it. Yeah, just the fact that they can attack in group that uh, makes them the top predator in the ocean. And we have seen the same videos of orcas attacking sharks for sure. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> okay, um, there's another question in the chat. It is, can you confirm for the comfort of all the surfers that white sharks under eight feet are not hunting us? Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> so I don't know if I can confirm that, <laughs> but um, what I can say for sure is that, so we need to understand that these newborn or juvenile white sharks, they, uh, they, they pretty much behave like any other fish and they are only trying to stay safe. That might be the reason why they are using shallow water so they can stay away from other larger fish that can become their predators or even away from uh, sea lions that can attack uh, juvenile or baby white sharks. So um, we know that they are also looking for prey such as fish and the stingrays. So they, they um, do not have a particular interest to attack a person. However, they can, as any other animal, they can get stressed if we are too close in too close proximity of a shark and they might bite, um, you know, to like, to protect themselves or, or because of the stress. Um, or they can confuse a person for a, a fish or also for a sea lion. And that happens when, when you know, we, we have seen many of these uh, examples in which they probably have been passing by and they have confused a person, they have bite and they have and they swim away. There is never, there has never been a uh, uh, any record of a shark eating a person. So that's uh, uh, also that that's a that let us know that sharks are not really chasing a person. We are not their prey. So, but they, they can totally bite us uh, by accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I cannot confirm that it won't be fine Sounds like a guarantee to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we have a lot of students here today. I see a lot of children. Um, so could you, if any of them are interested in studying marine biology in the future, what advice would you give them? Well, uh, if you were interested, interested in studying marine biology, uh, so my first advice is to try to get involved in marine biology research uh, as soon as you can. And um, we're right now with the COVID situation, we don't have as many volunteering opportunities, but in the past, we had many op volunteering opportunities for um, like pretty much for, for uh, uh, students, uh, of 18 years old and, and older, <laughs> but also high school students could uh, volunteer for us during the summer and get to learn about the different research activities that we do. So we, we also rely so much on volunteers and we always need volunteers because we, we are many graduate students trying to run our projects and go to classes and do different things at the same time. 
and we really need volunteers all the time. So yeah, if you if you are interested in marine biology and you know what you want to study, or let's say you're interested in sharks, try to contact Dr. Frislow or other shark laboratory and let them know about your interests and let them know that you are interested to you or willing to volunteer for them in the summer or whenever you have the time. So you can start learning about uh, research and, and, and helping the graduate students in the lab. So that's my first advice. And then continue to learn about biology and marine biology and um, yeah, and, and try to pursue the career because it's a very fascinating and gratifying uh, uh, career. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, Brad, do you want to, oh wait, no, that wasn't a question. <laughs> um, well, I want to say something about learning about marine biology that uh, for me has been very interesting. So, um, so typically the people who love sharks or, you know, we typically love one particular group of the species and we just want to study biology, but we undermine other fields that are very important for having a broad understanding of, of marine life. And something that I have encountered in the shark lab is that we really rely so much on technology and engineering tools and maths and statistics. So it's very important for everybody who is, is trying to, or, or is willing to study uh, marine biology to have a broad perspective and to have also a good interest for mathematics and, and, and calculus and, um, and engineering and, and different other fields that at the end are going to complement and help you better understand marine species. I agree. I'm I'm a chemical engineer by training, so um, it's good you point that out. So kids, learn your math <laughs> and science. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, if there are no other questions, I just want to say thank you so much, Lorena, for joining us tonight. I learned a lot, and your presentation also answer to the lo a lot of the questions I had about shark research and also um, how we interact with sharks in the water. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, Bill, for having me here. I was very excited to share a little bit about our research. And thank you so much. And hopefully we will keep on staying safe <laughs> using our beach areas. And, and uh, good luck to everybody everybody and if you have any questions don't hesitate to reach out to me i think i share my email or you can contact uh, michelle and, and she can uh, send my uh, email so you can uh, ask any questions so thank you so much great job lorena thank you very much that was great thank you, thank you lorena thank you so much maria Thank you. Awesome. Thanks to everybody for joining. We appreciate it. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thanks, Michelle, for putting it all together. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Take care. Oh, and there's my dad. Bye, dad. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Hi, dad. <laughs> yes, Michael Jerome. Michelle, that was really great. And thank you, Lorena, for, for being there and presenting. Um, Lorena, my, my good friend, Alyssa Clevenstein, she highly recommended you when I said, we're getting a Shark Lab presentation next month. I told her about it last month. And I said, we have Lorena speaking. And she said, she's the best, literally the oh, best. Yeah. So. She's awesome. I love her so much. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. She's amazing. Now she's in Oakland, right? Yes, I'm up there in Oakland working for um, Fish and Wildlife. So on her way, in a career so cool. of hopefully a career long for the for the uh, agencies, government agencies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's very cool. I'm very excited for her. So where did you meet, Elisa? <laughs> oh, uh, we worked together at Catalina Island teaching marine science. 
Oh, so wow. your oh. shark facts tonight were taking me back. I was like, oh yeah, I remember the, I remember the surprise on kids' faces when you tell them all the things. And I love that there were um, some young people here tonight with those questions because it was, it's so good. It's so great to share that information because they immediately tell their parents, tell their siblings next time at their beach that, oh, you don't have to be afraid of sharks. I learned this. And it's one of the greatest joys, I think, of sharing information from marine science because they're so fascinating yet they're so feared and for the wrong reasons. So when people latch on to sharks and then they learn something amazing about them, then they're way more likely to remember that amazing fact versus all the hyped up myth stuff. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have to do a lot of work in order to help, uh, you know, to reveal or redirect that fear into a, a greater appreciation for our ocean. Because over, you know, over the past, I guess, I think three decades or two decades, we have had, have had those shark movies. Yes. Uh, <laughs> like portraying sharks as the greatest predator. Everybody should be scary of them. And and yeah, and the, the fact that we have that make that many people start fearing them and wanted to kill them. <laughs> without even knowing about their biology. So yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool that we are able to share this kind of research. And it's also pretty cool that we have been able to receive funding from California State <laughs> uh, in order to continue with this research because these research, this type of research is very expensive. And I didn't mention much of that, but uh, like, each receiver that we have, we have 62 re receivers placed in Southern California, but each receiver can be $2,000 each. Each tag can be from uh, $400 to $700, $800 each. <laughs> and uh, the live boy that I show in one, one of the videos can be $13,000 um, each. <laughs> so uh, it can be really expensive, but unfortunately, um, it's the only way that we can track movements in these cute, greatly migratory species. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I wanted to introduce you to Anna. She is with our chapter, and I told you about her earlier. She's from Colombia. Hi, Anna. Nice to meet Hello. you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. And it's yeah. so good to see everyone tonight. I'm so happy because I, I haven't been able to join our meetings or you guys' meetings. So I'm going to I'm gonna do better this year, I promise. Um, this was amazing, Lorena. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed uh, sharing the presentation, sharing some of our research with, with you all guys. And hopefully soon we will have more information, especially about the, the question about uh, the change, uh, the yearly change in uh, aggregation hotspots that is very interesting because every single year we yeah. see sharks moving in different specific beaches and we really don't know what are the environmental parameters, uh, parameters that are triggering those aggregations. So, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, we will have a better information about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then um, Nina, was that Nina? Yeah. Yes. Long Beach. So you're in the same neighborhood as a shark lab. So. Yes, I am. I went to school where the shark lab is. I had a friend, Sarah Luongo, who was in the shark lab. I familiar with the shark lab. Yeah, Sarah is in Florida right now. Yeah, or she yeah, she was just in Hawaii for a little stint. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, so she's doing awesome things. That's awesome. Well, very nice to meet you. What's your name, sorry? Nina. Nina. Nice to meet you. You as well. Thank you. Yeah. So hopefully things will change uh, during the fall or next year. So we will be able to open our doors once again and have also new volunteers and, and people visiting the lab. So that, that would be great. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Awesome. All right. Well, I have to hop off, but thanks, everybody. Good yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Good seeing you, Sarah. Thanks okay. again, Lorena. Great job, Michelle, um, helping to lead. I appreciate your help. Great seeing everybody. Thank you. Next time. Thank yes. You. Thanks Bye, so everybody. much. Bye. 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 Bye.